This is Bringing Down Security, and I'm Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. What's going on, Mr. Brake? Not much, not much. Uh, you know, we finally wrangled the gentleman we've been trying to get since DerbyCon, after DerbyCon. He gave a fantastic talk, one of the few that I saw at last year's DerbyCon uh, that I definitely put on I did not miss, and I was not disappointed. Uh, you may know him from such podcasts as... Well, this one, where he was a, <laughs> he was a guest co-host when Mr. Betcher was on vacation. Um, welcome back, uh, Lee Brotherston, to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Right on. So um, everybody knows Lee. He's a big superstar up in the Toronto area. Uh, Cheryl Biswas speaks highly of him, uh, who uh, we're hopefully will have on in a in a future podcast again. Uh, you still work for Leviathan Security? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes, because they're a badass company. Why wouldn't you want to work for them? So they don't pay us to say that. It's just, it's kind of. <laughs> They'll be pleased you said that, though. Well, I'm just, you. you know, Frank, Frank will love that. So, <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So we're going to talk about your uh, TLS, uh, a, lot, a lot of what you spoke about at DerbyCon. There'll be a link to the actual discussion off from Iron Geek's website, no doubt. But we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, TLS and, and what it does and, you know, some of the stuff that we found out in the last couple of weeks about malware actually using TLS to, you know, propagate itself. And, um, you know, we can we can start from there. So um, I wanted to, you know, as we normally do, do a little bit of history about where T uh, TLS came from. Uh, TLS is old. It came out in uh, the first uh, version of it came out in 1999. And there's been uh, three versions of it. The latest version is 1.2. And uh, the latest, uh, the next version, 1.3, is out in draft right now. And they're still trying to, you know, hammer it out. And, you know, it's going to remove support for MD5 and, and other cryptographic hash functions and add things, uh, uh, you know, like uh, additional, you know, support for, uh, various ciphers and getting rid of things like compression and renegotiation. So, um, Lee, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit, of, give us a synopsis about, uh, you know, why we should fingerprint TLS and, and you know, what, 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 what's that for? Okay, so um, the main reason is that obviously the intention of encryption is to make an eavesdropper go blind so they don't know what's going on inside any particular session, which is great from the point of view of privacy, uh, but from the point of view of someone defending a network, it can be uh, troublesome insofar as if an attacker is using encryption, you don't know what they're doing or even if they are doing something, you just see data and you have no idea what it really is. You can draw some inferences from things like IP addresses. You know, if it's a, a known IP address, say that of a Google web server, and you see connections to it on port 443, you can probably guess that someone's do, using a Google service, for example. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you're pretty much blind. So the point of the fingerprinting was to be able to determine what clients are being used. So as an example... Um, by doing fingerprinting, I can not only tell what browser is being used, but I could determine if you have a Tor session that's open or a connection to Dropbox or something like that, which uh, from the point of view of someone defending a network, it can be pretty important because if you're in the middle of an incident and you think there's data exfiltration going on, for example, um, seeing connections from a native Tor or Dropbox client as examples mm -hmm could be something that you want to go look at. But it, if you're not fingerprinting, all you're seeing is um, connections to port 443. Uh, and from one IP so, to the so, other. From one IP to another, and that's pretty much all you see. So without the fingerprinting, you're kind of blind, and your best guess is based on the IP addresses that are being used. Well, so, can, can you go by length of amount of time? I mean, if you've got a TLS connection running for eight hours, isn't that a, wouldn't that be a, like a red, red flag itself? Uh, it can be, uh, especially if the data's in the wrong direction, like it's all going out, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, but there are plenty of uh, clients these days that use um, port 443 because it's 
for want of a better word, it's the universal firewall bypass port. Sure, sure. You see <laughs> mangled crap on port 443, and every proxy firewall in the land just goes, don't know what that is, probably HTTPS, whatever, just let it through. Um, the amount of clients that do it, I mean, we're talking now on Skype. I fingerprinted Skype, and I can see connections on port 443, but this is not an HTTPS session. Um, but it knows that that's a common way to get through perimeter firewalls and things, so apps use it. So whilst you're right that an HTTPS session in this example shouldn't last that long, there are so many apps that abuse that very fact that you can't always be sure that that's, that's really the case. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. I'm not saying that the fingerprinting is a be-all and end-all sort of silver bullet, um, but uh, it's another thing to throw in the arsenal. It's one more bit of information to have to use, especially... Um, if you're using it like I'm currently using it, which is not in a blocking mode, but in a passive information detection mode. So you're not you're not hammering out connections and stopping them working. You're purely gathering the information then if you have a reason to go and look. The same as you would go and look at logs in your sim or something, you can go look up and see, right, what what sessions did we see? You know, did I see um any particular client or what did I see for this particular IP address or whatever? Okay. Um, now, did this come? Did this research come out of the earlier research you did, where your ISPs were adding, injecting ads into your uh, into your feed through HTTP? Did Did you say, well, what are they doing to HTTPS, or was this just did, totally separate? It, it is separate-ish. Um, <laughs> no, it's mostly separate. I I say ish because I did do what you said. I went and looked, but found they weren't touching HTTPS. Purely because, like you, like we were saying, they're blind to it. They they couldn't do anything. Okay. Um, but it it started in the same way. Insofar as um, I had something small, I went and looked at, and it sparked a bit of interest. And then I went digging and digging and digging till it grew into its own thing. Um, and this actually came out of. Do you remember when Superfish came out? Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Lenovo were uh, had it pre bundled. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that the handshakes look different on Superfish infected machines to uh, other machines because what it actually did was ran a proxy locally and man in the middle the HTTPS session. And it was its own yep. client to the internet, which meant it had its own handshake. So I, I did an early version of this technique, which doesn't fingerprint the whole handshake, but it just looks at um, the uh, what they call the cipher suites that are being offered in the client hello packets. And I built some snort signatures built on that just to oh, be able to pick sweet. that up. And a, and a couple of others, Priv Dog was another one, Genius Box was another one. There was a little spate of yep. a bunch of them coming out at once. Yep. Um, yeah, so I built these little snort rules. And it was kind of useful because I had a bunch of friends who um, work in companies that have a very sort of bring your own device kind of style of working. So, so they don't have an asset uh, inventory where they can go, right, who's got a Lenovo in this building? Like. Mm. That was just not a thing. Um, the only way they could do it was through traffic analysis. So I built that up and gave it to a couple of friends, and they could fix things up. Um, and then as it happened, I was I started looking and was like, oh, oh, I can actually tell Chrome from Firefox. That's interesting. And looked a bit more. And then it got to the point where I was like, okay, let's actually work this out a bit more. So I looked at other um, other features of the packets that you could analyze. So I built up a, a more comprehensive way of checking than just the cipher suites because the more of the packet you can use for analysis the less likely you are to have collisions between two clients that look similar mm -hmm. um okay. i think so i what, i think I what all <clears throat> what all is your okay so you've got these different things you look at what yeah. all are they okay can, so can you go run down a list or i can uh i should I should probably do a brief explanation of how TLS actually does its handshake first for it to make sense how the yeah. finger works. Um, but the way TLS works is that there is no predefined encryption type. So when people say things are TLS encrypted, they don't mean TLS encrypted. They mean encrypted using a connection that uses TLS for negotiation. Yeah. Uh, and they, they normally mean TLS when they're saying SSL these days too. Um, and so what it does is, um, before it can drop into full encrypted mode, they have to decide what type of encryption is being used. It needs to be mutually um, 
agreed upon between the client and the server end of the connection. So they both announce their capabilities. They say, right, I can support these cipher suites, these hashing functions. Uh, I allow these elliptic curves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they switch to, um, it's not necessarily the best one, but they announce them in a preference order. So whatever is the, the sort of common highest preference, they, uh, they meet up uh, and use that. So that's what I actually look at, the client hello, which is the first packet that the client sends to the server after the TCP handshake, contains um, the largest chunk of it normally is the list of supported cipher suites in a preference order. Um, and then there is some keying material that really I don't use because it's things like session IDs and that sort of thing, which by definition you can't use for fingerprinting because they're meant to change every time. So I ignore a bunch of that stuff. Um, but then there are extensions. And there's three ways we use the extensions. Uh, there's logging what extensions there are, uh, and I can come to what those are in a sec. Um, there's what order they come in, because um, this is one of those um, packet formats that uh, data with an offset, uh, the offset tells you to jump to the next bit of data, and so on and so on. And each of those offsets jumps you to the next extension. And so the order that the extensions appear in within the packet also is a giveaway. And then third, um, there are a few extensions that are worth actually delving into the content of. So, for example, um, elliptic curve cryptography is an extension in TLS. So the list of curves that you support is in there. Uh, if you use compression, the list of uh, compression types that you support is in there. So I go and grab those. And, uh, you know, there's, there's like two, three, four extensions that I actually parse the extension contents of too. Um, and then it just writes it out into, sorry, I made a tool that writes it out in like a JSON format so you can consume it and put it towards tools and what have you. Um, and that's really all you need for the fingerprint. There is one other bit of information that I grab for logging, but I don't include in the fingerprint. Uh, which is that um, the host name that's being used because of... of um, the hosting multiple HTTPS hosts on one IP address. Mm -hmm. You have the HTTPS equivalent of a host header. Um, so that's in there too, which I extract for dumping into logs, but I made a conscious decision not to make that part of fingerprints because that's basically the same as having an IP address blacklist or something like that, which people already use and we already know the problems with maintaining a blacklist and that sort of thing. So I deliberately excluded that from uh, being a part of the fingerprint, but it does, if you're running it in a logging mode, it does extract that, so it's a bit of extra information. So it'll say, you know, Chrome 47 connecting to Bing or whatever, and, you know, so you can glean a bit more info as to what's going on. Okay, so this sounds like a lot of the stuff you're grabbing is not even encrypted. It's just like, well, if you will, the metadata that, uh, of the of the TLS handshake. Yeah, it's it's the handshake. Well, it's the handshake content. Yeah, and because because of the history of TLS, or more what the problem that TLS is trying to solve, um, this cannot be uh, encrypted because the issue that TLS is trying to solve is that unlike a situation where you have a defined client and server where you can say, right, we are always going to use this form of encryption. Um, you can't with TLS because it's solving, the most obvious example is the web server, web browser issue. The, there are however many web servers in the world and they don't know which web browser is going to connect to it, let alone which version of which web browser. And conversely, the browsers connect to websites, and they have no idea if it's Apache Engine XIIS or whatever, mm -hmm. um, or the versions either. So they have no idea. They can't just say, right, we're all using AES or whatever. Um, they have to negotiate because some of them are old, some are new, some are in countries subject to export controls, some are not. Um, so it has to negotiate encryption. But because you're trying to negotiate encryption, you can't start encrypted because, you know, it's a chicken and right. egg. You, you cannot yep. be encrypted to negotiate the encryption because you haven't negotiated the encryption. Mm -hmm. so yeah, card before horse. Yeah. <laughs> so which, this is why, um, why it works in this way, uh, because it's not just like key exchange information. It actually is, you know, what, what 
cipher are we going to use? Are we going to compress this data? What size key are we going to use? That kind of information. So, yeah, so that's all um, readily available if you know how to parse the packets. It's another one of these. Um, it's not in an ASCII format. So it's not like when you're reading SMTP or HTTP where you could literally just read the text off the screen and go, oh, right, yeah, that's what it's doing. But it's not encrypted. If you know the format of the packet and you're sat there with a hex dump, you can totally work this out. Or, or if you have something like Wireshark, it decodes a huge chunk of that for you. Okay. Or my tools, obviously. <laughs> or your tool, yeah. Well, well, I should yeah. have that too. <laughs> obviously. Now, does it does it send like its whole cipher suite that it's that it's uh, capable of of doing, like say the the client or the server, or does it just send the first one? Like, I want to do this one. Can you do it? Just a whole lot. They typically send like twenty to fifty possibilities when they dang, uh, which is why you get a lot of these like degrade attacks because so many of them hedge their bets and sort of do the hey I'm going to support this huge long list mm, yeah. and you know people that man in the middle you can't man in the middle the crypto because you break it but you can man in the middle this clear text and you can edit out cipher suites that you feel may be too strong which is exactly what you know some of the more oppressive Downgraded. regimes in the world might do um, yeah and so these clients that hedge their bets and want to be like hyper compatible with everything often announce like some pretty poor um, cipher suites. And the, the, the bit that's really surprising with it is that makes total sense in, to a degree for something like a browser where you don't know what's going to happen on the other end. The one that gets me is where people are in charge of both the server and the client infrastructure and they still <laughs> offer up this, like, this wide range. But you think about things like Netflix or Twitter or Skype or Uber or whatever where it's like there's one app and you built it and there's one server and you built it <laughs> Like, yeah. why don't both have to support like 50 different things to negotiate? <laughs> like, why can't you have like your preferred one and maybe a couple of fallbacks? I, yeah. I don't get it, but they do. They're like, well, That's no, I know why. Crazy. It's a real, it's a real world thing. It's a, they pay developers to develop a thing yeah. and they use like standard frameworks and then go, oh, but I don't want to support MC5, MD5 or RC4 or something and cross them off the list and just take everything else or whatever. Well, because of those, those are the ones they've heard about. The other ones are like, I don't know what idea CBC, De, you know, triple des is, right, and if it's right. a bad thing or not, you know. Right, exactly. But what, but what it leads to is that these people, they just use like shared libraries or whatever, or some of them even, you think you're running an app, but you're not. Um, a lot of them are almost like a um, full screen uh, browser, and they're not really an app app in the true sense. So you can... And you can tell that from the fingerprinting, too, because they show up as like WebKit or whatever fingerprints. Um, but yeah, so it, what it means is that these apps um, are potentially needlessly exposing themselves to all these weak ciphers because they haven't narrowed it down. And they could have just said, right, we're going to take these three, say, for just in case they need to deprecate one at some point. So it, it's another case of... Um developers architects i mean the whole lot just not doing their homework it, it could be it could well be i mean I, or, or it could be that they don't perceive this to be the same problem that i perceive it to be or or maybe there's historic stuff um i mean taking example twitter's i guess the easy example they used to allow third-party apps they don't so much anymore maybe they had the variety from back then, and it's just a legacy thing that's never really been addressed or something. But, um, but yeah, I, I have yet to see an app that just does the, I'm using this, this one thing, and, yeah. I'm, and that's it. I don't think there's one in the database, and I'm coming up on the 280, 300 mark-ish on fingerprints, really? and I have yet to see anything that long down. <laughs> What's your what's your percentage wow. of hits? I mean, are are you like okay? Yes, I know that that is, you know, Chrome version fifty three. How 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 can they be so random? And how can you have so many fingerprints? <clears throat> is it just per application, or is it can you can you break it down by version of application even? Um, ish, <laughs> ish, ish. Okay. Um, well, what happens is, I mean, Chrome's a really good example, actually. Or, or the browsers as a whole. Mozilla, Firefox does exactly the same. Um, they occasionally make a change. They go, oh, we don't like this cipher anymore, or we want to bump this one up the list, or we want to start supporting something new, or whatever. Um, and the fingerprint changes. But they, but it's not like 
it's not like I'm fingerprinting the binary on the disk. So a new release doesn't guarantee a new um, fingerprint. But if they change anything in how they implement their TLS, whether that's the TLS stack itself or, or even just the configuration of it, the default config, then yes, it does change. So what I tend to get is I go, oh, this is Chrome 43 through 47 somewhere. Okay. And you can't say exactly, but you can get a rough idea of the sort of heritage of the of the connection. Um and uh it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than where you are without being able to do the fingerprinting. I mean the lack of fingerprinting changing between versions is also a um a benefit in a way because although you don't have full granularity on the versions it also means that the minute someone releases a 0.0.0.0.1 upgrade on something i don't have to re-fingerprint everything all over again a lot of the mm. time it'll just keep going and i've already got detection it's not like um like an ip blacklist where you know 10 minutes later you're out of date it's uh it, it stays for a reasonable amount of time but that said, Chrome updated today, and suddenly the web sockets from Chrome are <laughs> new fingerprints. So. Now, could that is it, could that be just because they have bumped a, a like an, a lib SSL uh, a library, or I mean, what does it take to actually make a change like that, other than just you know the web for socket? Some, for some apps, it can be a bump in the library. The browsers um, are the one class of apps that really think long and hard about what they do and do not do in their TLS. Um, they have very uh, conscious decisions on what algorithms they do and do not want to support, for example. Um, they don't just go, oh, open a cell changed, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> compile against it, done. Um, they actually, you know, they, they code in specifically in their code to enable and disable things. Um, so, yeah, the browsers... That's more that they have made a cognitive decision. They've decided to change something. Or they've implemented a new feature and you see a new extension appear in the list. Okay. Um, other apps, yeah, it can be as simple as we've compiled against a new library. Um, I mean, for example, um, there are some apps I've seen where the developer obviously um, – does not compile things themselves because you can tell from the fingerprint, and I verified by looking at the binaries that they've used a um, like a Python to XE converter thing, and ah. um, you know it's it just happens to be whatever version of the Python to XE converter thing <laughs> yeah. that's using, and that bundles up uh, the libraries with it, and they don't really have much of a say about it. So yeah, it, wow. it varies app to app. And then some of them are dependent on the OS. Like I've noticed if you look at like cell phone apps, um, some of them do their own TLS, but some of them just use like the OS provided. I'm not quite sure exactly how it works, but they have very similar um, fingerprints that look like they're just making a generic system call to make a TLS connection thingy, please. Very cool. <laughs> so we, so um, how, how many unique fingerprints have you found? What percentage of those in your database are unique? Let me have a look. I am on the one that's in front of me, which I think is the one I've got on GitHub, is at 248 currently. Um, now, there are a few duplicates. There are a couple of applications that have multiple signatures for the application, yeah. um, but not many. It's pretty much Chrome. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chrome, I had to make multiple ones because they have a habit of um, they have a padding uh, packet that you can put into the options, which is like the TLS equivalent of a knot uh, when you're doing like assembly or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they um, they randomly throw those in. So most versions of Chrome have two or three uh, fingerprints because depending on what's happening in a connection, you get padding packets occasionally. But that aside, most of them ha are unique. They have a a single um, fingerprint to match an app, or if there's multiple fingerprints for an app, it's um, it's multiple versions of the app of the same app. Uh, yeah, of the same app. Yeah. So in that 248, I've got all the major browsers because I used a um, a web developer's um, uh, service mm -hmm. where they fire all the browsers at you yeah. and um, so that you can see if your CSS broke something they use it they generate screenshots yeah. and send them to you but I didn't care about that I was just packet sniffing all the connections yeah. um, <laughs> but I've been getting all sorts of stuff like 
Um, all the major um, sort of uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive type services, I've gone through all those. Uh, Tor. Um, I've got all sorts of random things like um, VMware Fusion polling for its update, uh, the Atom text editor polling for its update. Um, I uh, ran in the middle of my Polycom phone and I got the TLS handshake when it does a, a um, corporate directory phone lookup. Um, where else have we got in here? We've got random, oh, we've got some random NVIDIA thing <laughs> that I don't even know where it was. The Cisco AnyConnect um, SSL VPN. Um, Very nice. Things, uh, Metasploits, Heartbleed Scanner, and all sorts. So there's like a, a real mix you can get in. So, um, so you're not talking just browsers, but like if somebody updated their Adobe Acrobat Pro, you'd be able to tell when that happened or um, yeah. like you like SMTPS traffic. Like, okay, this this server sent out an SMTPS traffic because they connected over TLS. Does this right. work for SSL as well or just TLS? Works for SSL other than SSL1. And if I see SSL1, I would have some kind of heart attack. Uh, <laughs> mainly because SSL1 is like, it was never really used and is like completely undocumented. And I have no idea how to parse it. And I have no samples to look at. Um, really, what I'm looking at mostly is the, the, the three, issue, uh, three versions of TLS that are out in SSL v3. I don't really see anything else um, from where I'm looking. Um, as you get older, uh, it actually gets harder because SSL has um, way less features. So there's less data there to actually fingerprint. There, you're almost down to just cipher suite selection. It's really TLS where you started getting getting a bit more. Right. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's anything. And, um, and that's irrespective of what port it's on. Because actually TLS, I, I did some research on this too. And um, spotting TLS running on a not typically TLS port is actually pretty easy to do too. Um, so I make this, uh, the tool I wrote just scans like all ports. It does wholesale packet sniffing. Um, okay. So it can pick it up on whatever port it's on. Um, and yeah, then you can just like deconstruct it because it, uh, it's the first um, packet from the client that we're interested in. So it's like, it's super wow. easy to, to pick up and look at. Okay. So, I mean, it does, um, you know, you mentioned as I mentioned SMTPS, you mentioned uh, LDAP because you were doing directory lookups. So LDAP S on, uh, I, I would assume you could look at like Microsoft global catalog on like 68, whatever the port for that is six, you know, 636 for LDAP S and those. So it'll yeah. find all those at what does, yeah, what does, and, what does and, something and like that show up as? Um, they vary. I haven't, uh, this one, the one I was looking at was a Polycom that was looking at, which is a, yeah, a VoIP phone. So it's looking okay. up, um, uh, names and numbers in a corporate directory, Great. but, um, you can, uh, I mean, you can do anything. The way I wrote the tool was it's not just a detection. Um, it generates the fingerprints itself. So if it sees, um, something it doesn't recognize mm -hmm. it can spew out the fingerprints and you can go oh i know what that is based on ip address and whatever um and you can put a name in and pull that fingerprint back in and add it into the database yourself so um yeah so the idea is that um if it sees something it hasn't seen like you said like a directory service that uses a tls connection you can just run it uh tell it what it is and it'll know next time because this fingerprint the fingerprinting is not really a uh, a big uh, global effort like i put in uh a bunch myself uh, a couple of people have contributed them in after i gave the talks at DerbyCon and sector so i got some some more fingerprints but it's predominantly uh me running it on my desktop and going right what doesn't it recognize and start like, <laughs> throwing things in um and then trying to get pcaps from wherever i can but uh yeah, it's far from complete. I mean, it, there's a, a lot more. It, this is just based on what I have. Very cool. So if I was a bad guy, obviously, uh, the first thing I'm thinking about is is uh, information gathering. So right. uh, are, are there any other methods by which you would want to do this? I mean, and I say information gathering, but I mean, it's got to be pretty targeted for information gathering, right? Uh, you mean in the in the sort of the oh my god the NSA's kind of uh, information well, gathering? Are you talking hacker kind of? Yeah, I mean this would only you couldn't just turn this on any 
server out there on the internet, this is mostly client side is what you're looking at, right? So it would have to be specific hosts doing things, not just servers. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the clients. Um, you can fingerprint servers, but I didn't really bother fingerprinting servers because servers by nature tend to announce what they are. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously you can hide it, but you go to a web server, it'll probably tell you if it's Apache or IIS or whatever. Yeah. Um, so clients There's OS like, fingerprinting software out there anyway. Yeah, so. and yeah. That's the, yeah, and that's the other big thing is a server, the point of it is that it's there and available. So you can connect to it and probe it. A client, you can't say what browser you're running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have to actually catch it browsing. Um, but the way, I, I, the way I've written this is to be, you could use it wholesale in terms of you could just watch a whole network and it will just spew out uh, fingerprints per connection. Um, the one caveat with it, as is always the case with this stuff, is you need to be in a position to sniff it. So I can't just sit here in, in my house and say, right, what are you doing? Yeah, I would need to be on your network, on the network of something you're connecting to, or in a position like an ISP or a signals intelligence agency where I can get to your data like on the wire. Um, yeah. So I can't just go and probe random people on the internet. That said, if an attacker has got into your network and is doing things, then they most likely could get into a position. So mm -hmm. uh, the example I gave in the talk was that um, you know attacker breaks in, gets access to a desktop LAN, and if anyone's seen you know a, a pen tester attacking a desktop LAN, you, you'll know that a lot of the time things like ARP spoofing or pretending to be a DHCP server or whatever to route sure. all traffic through you is mm -hmm. a thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And in that position, you can use it. Um, and the example I gave, well, there was there was two main ones. One is that you can. Um, sit there and just information gather and go, right, okay, so they're running X, Y, and Z, and I'll use that for whatever reason, social engineering or knowing where to go and try and find accounts. But the other thing was that if I know clients, I can, I can determine real time if I want to attack them. So if I have a vulnerability, for example, I know that a particular web browser has a current vulnerability in it where it is not checking certificate authorities properly. And that's happened a bunch of times. Different browsers at different times have said, hey, we're not properly checking, I don't know, certificate chaining or something. Um, right. And with this specially crafted certificate, you can bypass all the HTTPS checks. But if I can okay. make, uh, if I can sniff and make a decision on the first packet, especially if I'm man in the middling them, I can go, I can go, right, is this a vulnerable browser or not? And go, okay, I've got an exploit against IE, say. And I see Firefox and I go, nope immune let it pass chrome let it pass then i see an ie connection go right now i'm going to drop the exploit on it mm. what that means is that although it doesn't gain you any extra people that you're attacking all the people that were would that are immune and would have had those https warning uh alerts come up are now passing through silently so it gives you stealth and it gives a bit longer to be able to work a network before someone notices most likely very cool that's the bigger attacker sort of perspective right. on and you know as much as i hate to use the term marketing you could also use this on a network to find out like a public network to find out you know what applications are being used where people are surfing you know you know where where what people are using for browsers what plugins right. are popular those kinds of things as well right exactly and the other uh, the other similar line but a twist on that i was using for defensive was um, on web servers, I was fingerprinting the clients, not because I really care what browsers people are using, but I like knowing when Burp Suite with, and Metasploit were connecting to me. Oh, very nice, yeah. So you could you could use that to, you know, keep, you know, know that your pen testers are accessing your site or, you right, know, exactly. some skiddies trying to, you know, use Metasploit on you, yeah. Right, exactly. Or okay. vice versa, ruling stuff out, like... Um, uh, I had one for Nexpose, which is the uh, Rapid7 uh, vulnerability scanner tool. Oh, yeah. And and you can go, okay, I'm seeing attacks from this, but oh, it's the it's my internal VA tool or whatever. You yeah. Know. <laughs> yep. Um, so uh, could you also use it to, say, block applications at your firewall? So, hey, I noticed Tor, for instance, is being used... I can use this as a like an IDS or an IPS snort, uh, rule to to block traffic. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. You completely could. I mean, the the tool as it stands at the minute. When I spoke at DerbyCon, it was kind of very POC style. Uh, Not now POS, I've... POC, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and since then, I've been working on making it less POC and more actually a thing, uh, less kludgy and whatever, and a bit more optimized. But it's still kind of an IDS level thing. Um, so it's more a detection than a blocking. Uh, but that's not because it's impossible. That's purely because I just evolved it from a, a, a binary that takes pcaps and you know, and it's using libpcap to uh, um, sniff the data. Um, but it's written purposefully in a way that's fairly portable to kernel modules. So I plan to port it over and actually do something that can uh, block. So yeah, you could totally block. Um, in, in fact, you could probably take the data and in files that cope with payload inspection, you could probably do that now by taking my data and exporting it into those firewalls and doing something with it. But uh, I haven't done that yet, but I am going to do the kernel module thing and start doing some blocking that way. Okay. So you basically live in, uh, do you use TCP dump for, with custom filter or, I mean, or Wireshark with custom filters or do you just use raw TCP dump? It's... It's not even raw TCP. It uses libpcap, which is the same thing that TCP dump uses, but it's not actually using TCP dump. It, uh, it's a method or, it, well, it's a library that lets you access uh, packet sniffing capabilities of operating systems in the same way across OSs. Okay. So it means that you can write the same tool and it will work on Mac OS, Linux, BSDs, to a degree Windows under SIGWIN if it's got WinPCAP. Okay. Windows is a bit of a special case, but um, but it's mostly the same, and it's the tool that. But it is it's what it's what TCP dump and Wireshark and Snort and Suricata and I think maybe Bro as well all use libpcap as their method of obtaining packets. It's a fairly standard way of doing things, um, and then they use what are called Berkeley packet filters, which is where you can ask it to pre-filter before it comes to the uh, uh, to your tool. So you can say, I only want things from this ip address on this port or whatever so you can you can filter it down further the same way that you can with tcp dump okay well you know if you put a fancy gui on it i i think if you install something like zen map or use uh the nmap executable it requires you to install a lib pcap version uh, i think i've got 413 here on this box here just for futzing around with uh you know scanning of of nmap stuff so it's yeah. completely cross cross platform for you so that's good yeah no i mean and that's part of the reason for deciding to do it it's like with a lot of these things you can probably get more optimized by writing something per platform but if you've ever tried to develop something that you want to use on more than just your box that's probably not the way to go yeah. <laughs> it's fine if you're writing an appliance and you want people to run it right sorry to run like an appliance you've written but otherwise if you want people to run a tool on their os i think it needs to be as portable as possible so Lib pcaps on. I mean, it comes pre-installed on pretty much every BSD, Mac, and Linux box. And Windows has Win pcap, which uh, is an add-on driver, but it's you know it's an accepted thing. Very cool. So it's fairly available. But I haven't tried it on Windows actually. That's the one OS I'm really lacking on trying it. So I can't okay. comment. <laughs> um, let me see. I I know we talked about this earlier, but I was hoping uh, maybe we could do a quick demo yeah. are you okay with a demo i'm okay with a demo okay let me see if i can get quick time player set up so i can actually do that um mr butcher do you have any other questions while i'm trying to futz around with this <clears throat> so um you talked down. about um <laughs> passive info what is zomg <laughs> That's like like OMG, but with a Z. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I told That's you that, Mister Badger. You got oh man! <laughs> I'm editing this. It's going out the way it is. <laughs> so so you're 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 clicking around in the in the the whole uh, quick time thing. Um. Okay. Defense. Um. So you're. You're sniffing your your company's traffic, right, right on yeah. your network, and so you're looking for um, these things that are fingerprinted. Now, malware is 
most likely custom and you've never seen it before. So, right. so, you, so you talked about detecting malware, but um, how do you do that if you don't know its signatures? There's a couple of ways of doing it. You can go the AV vendor route of try and get samples, try and capture it, make fingerprints, but that puts you in the same loop as blacklists and um, and uh, and um, the AV people have constantly been in a state of catch up. But what you can do is, and the way I wrote my tools anyway to work with it, is that an unknown signature uh, that it sees, it drops it straight into the running database in memory but it's like it's called unknown signature one. Then the next one is unknown signature two and unknown signature three and whatever. Now, that doesn't give you anything helpful in so far as going, right, it's this piece of malware. But what it yeah. does mean is you can see the one signature hit multiple places. So if you if you find a host that's infected, infected and you did and you know it and you notice know, signature number 47 spewing out of it forever. You can now go and look up every instance of signature 47. You don't need to know what it is. You just know that it's the same as the infected host you just found. Very and good. And if, if, you're, it, if you're excellent at asset management, uh, you should know all the signatures beforehand, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. And in fact, I, I, I spoke about that really, really briefly, which is something I probably should talk about more, is that... Um, if you have a grip on your assets, you can use this in the whitelist sense. You don't have to detect bad. If you are one of these companies that has like your gold image and everyone runs the gold image or one yeah. of a few images, you can go, okay, this is the only browser fingerprint I expect to see. And this is the only mail client fingerprint I expect to see. And this is the only instant messenger fingerprint I expect to see, et cetera, et cetera. And just say, right, run the fingerprinting tool on the network. And anything it, it understands, just ignore, because that's part of my gold image and expected. And anything else at all is an alert. And I don't even care what it is, just anything else is an alert. The same yeah. as we were saying before about the companies where they make the client and the server, say, like taking Netflix, for example. They fingerprint their client before it's released, put it into their local fingerprint database. They see anything else connect. It's probably not what they want, and you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can drop that. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a route that you could totally take. Okay, so I, I, I'm trying to get everything set up. Uh, <coughs> I think I've got it. Am I sharing? Yeah, you're sharing. I can see your screen. Oh, good, cool. So um, I'm going to start recording at now. Okay. And all right, so we're recording. If it doesn't record the audio on the on the uh, on the MacBook, then I will just you know pull the Tascam audio and splice it into the video. Um, it'll yes. be so much fun. Yes, it's the twenty first <laughs> century, everybody. So, okay. so let me just let me just spawn up another window and move it off to one side. So, oh, now you're seeing all my magic. <laughs> okay, if you want to put your passwords up there, that's cool too. No, that's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't use that bit. Use this bit. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so what I have is a split screen window. Um, on the bottom, I've got a TCP dump. Uh, you can ignore that long um, spewed mess. Um, what that is, is that's the filter. And that's a filter to mostly knock data down to just... TLS, so it's ignoring my local network traffic and just just going to TCP dump out um, uh, TLS stuff. Um, and additionally, um, I'm running a special patch. Well, not a special patch. It's the Apple standard, but it's it's only on Macs, um, which is really nice. Any locally generated traffic, uh, it will actually tell you the process name in the TCP dump, not just uh, the data. Oh, nice. This is purely so I... Oh, great. I can't even do my password. This is purely so I can show you um, that my tool is getting the right analysis of the fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So like you can see here, um, that's a connection from Chrome. Yep. I don't know if it's readable on your screen, but it's a connection from Chrome. So if I run my tool on the top half, um, this will do a similar thing. So if I go, and I've got another window on another screen you can't see, but if I use curl to try and get uh, Google 
you should see a line on TCP dump and my tool. Yeah. So my tool, oh, my tool actually did not, <laughs> did not um, match TCP dump because TCP dump didn't grab the process. But that's curl grabbing Google that I'm highlighting here. Okay. There's the tool getting curl there. Let's get one that doesn't upset it. Like if I use Chrome. Oh, there we go. I open Chrome and you can oh, see wow. mine say, here's Chrome listed off. You see the the numbers here, the one, two, and three. That's what I was saying about multiple fingerprints for Chrome because mm -hmm. of padding. You can see it's pulled the server name out. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see that's TCP dump, which normally wouldn't have the process ID, but I'm capturing local traffic, so it's it's able to pick that up. Um, so really all that's showing is that it's able to sniff that off the wire, correctly identify um, what the client is, um, what TLS versions it's running, and then the host it's connecting to. Okay. Uh, you can't get full URLs, but you can get the host names, which, as I'm sure you can appreciate, in some cases is enough to know what someone's doing. Sure. Um, you know, there are some websites where you don't need to know the specific URL. The domain name alone will tell you what someone's what someone's thinking, looking yeah. at. So you uh, could you could definitely add like the Google ads down there, if you didn't want people to go in certain domains or having certain domains load, you could actually almost use this for ad blocking, couldn't you? You could just say, okay, if it matches this, yeah. you know, domain and this fingerprint, then you could, you could kill it. Yes, you could. And actually, oh. hooray, this has just turned up. If you see this here, I'm actually outputting two things. This isn't the normal log file. Uh, that is a fingerprint for an unknown connection, which I deleted from the database. That's the Tech Secure desktop app, which you can tell because it gives the server name in the fingerprint for you to debug what it might be. Oh. Um, but that's um, yeah, that's the that's what the Tech Secure desktop app looks like. So um, what you could do is take that, um, go to the big long JSON file that we've got here, which is basically the fingerprints. Paste it in the bottom, rename the description to the tech secure desktop app, and um, you can start detecting straight away. Okay. So, I mean, that um, it takes a little time to get tuned in until you get all your fingerprints, or do does, does your application come with all of them loaded already? Uh, mine comes with them loaded. Uh, the fingerprints I've got come with it, but um, it automatically generates this JSON output uh, so that people can, you know, easily add them themselves. It keeps a little binary database. There's a Python script I've got that goes through that JSON file, sanitizes it, and dumps out a little binary um, that's consumed by the application. So um, you can, you literally, you just add it, edit a text file. I was doing it in Atom, but obviously, whatever, use Vim or Notepad or whatever you like. Um, run the Python script once and then yeah the app will just pick it up and start going with it or it'll run uh you can't see it super well here but what it actually does is it says um a new fingerprint detected dynamically adding to the in-memory database so it'll it'll keep detecting it now like the next time that comes up in fact there we go it came up again further down here the connection to tech secure and it doesn't spew out the fingerprint again it just goes dynamic fingerprint zero has appeared again so that's what i meant about the tracking malware i can now see the app over and over again even if i don't know what it is i know it's that app whatever it is occurring frequently so oh you're visiting linkedin i see are you updating your resume for you know general, <laughs> general kickassery you know yeah yeah, yeah obviously <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, and so, that, uh, <clears throat> it's a very good point that that demonstrates why um people still need to be careful when encrypted because there's still a fair amount of information you can derive even though this is an encrypted session i'm not man in the middle it. i haven't degraded the encryption in any way okay so how many um collisions are you getting um that are from different apps on your fingerprints crazy low <laughs> as in i was expecting it to be really frequent i was thinking i would have unique for the browsers because they're so specific about their cryptography and then i would have everything compiled against open ssl everything compiled against gnu tls and that would be largely me done and they keep turning up and in fact 
when I did have collisions, they turned out not to really be collisions. Um, the one that springs to mind is um, I managed to fingerprint archive.org connecting to my um, web server when they go through archiving web pages. I was like, awesome, I have fingerprinted archive.org. This is great. And then it turned up as a collision. It collided with um, Java. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, that sucks. I'm finally getting <laughs> And then I went to GitHub and had a look, and uh, the archive.org bot is written in Java. So it was ah. sort of, <laughs> it was like, it's sort of a collision, but it sort of isn't, because it just uses the bog standard Java connection to make its connection. So it was actually fingerprinting it correctly. So it's sort of a collision, sort of not. Um, but for the most part, they don't. I can only think of like three, four examples in the 250 odd signatures that are. Collision, collisions, um, and they're nearly all the same. Uh, then, then nearly uh, always um, like a shared library thing. So, for example, um, you will find that um, certain apps on OS X, for example, fingerprint the same as WebKit, and then you find that what the app actually does is it doesn't make its own, its own connection. It has embedded WebKit windows in the app. So it often looks like collisions. And then when you actually dig deeper, you find it's not really a collision. It really is just, just wow. WebKit. Um, now, how, so, what are, yeah. how, how OS specific can you get? I mean, obviously, if you have Internet Explorer, you're either run, you're running Windows. But, I mean, can you say, okay, I'm running Chrome on an Ubuntu 1204 LTS box or this Chrome is running on a, you know, Wiley Werewolf 1504? I mean, can, can, you, get, can you get that specific? Uh, not off. Well, actually, it depends. Browsers, because of their decisions, they made the same decision on every platform, and because they enforce their rules, you know, uh, Firefox, you get to the version, but you don't get what platform it's running on, generally speaking. There are some exceptions. Cell phones and tablets sometimes place restrictions that mean that you can tell when that's the case versus a uh, desktop install. But I can't tell OS X Firefox from Linux Firefox, no. Okay. However, <laughs> however, once you get outside of browsers where people are not um, quite so stringent on how they set up their connections and they're often just like linking against system libraries and that kind of thing, uh, then you can actually tell the difference. Um, well, I was just thinking about maybe reading like the user agent string. Is that available in that packet or is that in another packet? No, the user agent string is inside the encrypted part of the communication. Ah, Anything that you would get from HTTP or, or SMTP or any of the other protocols where you get the S and non-S version, the nearly always what you've got is you've got TLS running the plain text protocol inside the TLS uh, packet. So um, TLS will set up the encryption, but if you bust open the encryption, HTTPS is just HTTP wrapped in TLS. So all those packets and everything, all those headers and everything are all encrypted. The only reason I have the host header, um, it's like the chicken and egg thing with the crypto. Um, web servers need to present a certificate that matches the host name, but they can't present a certificate until they know what host name you're connecting to. Mm. So the host name has to go over in the clear as part of the, um, the uh, handshake in the first place. So that's why I'm able to extract the host name. But the rest of it, no, you can't tell anything about what's going on with the protocol. There are some guesses so, you can make, which, which I don't do, um, based on things like if you know what cipher has been chosen, you know what percentage it's likely to grow the payload. So based on the length of the reply, you can guess the length of the original payload, which makes you means you can guess what may have been in the protocol. But that's... Not a thing I've gone into. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty deep. The um, the TLS handshake is that always Diffie Hellman? Um, the key exchange. It, you know what? That is a question that is probably beyond what I have looked at on there. Uh, oh. I need to reread to be sure of what everything supports. I must admit there are certain areas of this where I have not gone into massive depth on how it works because the way I've been working is I don't actually need to know how certain areas work. There's only parts of it that I do. And uh, 
the key exchange I have largely ignored um, because uh, keying data, if done properly, is going to be unique to a session. So I've not been looking at how the... Oh, okay. I thought that potentially the um, the initial math uh, problem that was exchanged would be unique to a specific application, not unique to the session. I believe it's a session, unless I'm missing something. But I, but, okay. but anything to do with I, keying uh, and and the mathematical part. Uh, I well, I understand the computation based. would be unique yeah. to the session, but the initial um, the initial problem, right? Not the right. computation, but the problem. But um, yeah, you're probably right. It is unique. the The problem itself is unique to the session. So for Diffie Hellman, you you do like A mod B, something like that, mm -hmm, and then each right. side would would um, would choose their X and Y. Um, so I was thinking that A mod B would be unique to the application, and then the um, the X and Y would be unique to the session. Very cool. But uh, you haven't seen that, so check. so you probably know better <laughs> than I. No, that's probably more me not checking than me saying that it's not the same uh but i can say that i went through everything to do with keys to see if there were similarities and from a cursory uh, as in not a djb maths breakdown kind of style but from a cursory look it didn't scream um being uh something that i could pick up on but that's not to say it isn't there could well be something i didn't look at I didn't look at anything to do with that involved sort of deep mathematics. It was much more the, um, the stuff that remained constant, as in literally like same number in same position in the back. Kind of right. Level. Okay. I mean, there could well be some kind of fingerprinting you could do, I guess, in terms of there's a number of things with keys. Like if hosts had limited entropy, if there's something you could derive by, you know, the numbers that they generated or something like that but i must yeah. confess they're not really going that deep right now yeah so i mean um just before we had you on uh, a couple of weeks ago there was a well it wasn't a couple of weeks ago there was a blog post from cisco that they were talking about yeah. how malware is being is is using proper tls connections i mean like you know standard you know high quality tls connections and not like md5 or sha1 type connections yeah to help propagate or to communicate between uh what command and control hosts i would assume so from from right. what you're showing me at least on the demo it should be pretty easy for you to block with your ids or your ips uh, a server name or something that would be out of the ordinary like do a lot of the C2, I, I, I don't know a lot about the malware stuff. This would have to be something I'd ask Mr. Betcher's colleague, but do a lot of the C2 hosts only use IP addresses? Could that be something you could use to to block anything with an IP address or, um, you know, anything .ru, you know, could could you do it by a regex in that, in that manner? Well, you probably could, but one thing I would say is that you could, um, you could probably um, do it by fingerprint if they're using TLS. If it's a unique fingerprint, then you don't even need to know the hosts. You could you could block by fingerprint if the firewall is capable of doing that. Okay. Um, yeah. Or, or yeah. yeah. Or you could use it to extract IP addresses or something if you so wished. Um, it depends on you know, like some malware has surprisingly small command and control, and then you hear of these ones that have such a distributed network that you're just going to play whack-a-mole because every time you block an IP address, they'll just move to mm. the next, especially if it's one of these that uses a time calculation to derive where it's going to connect or something. Yeah, yeah but see, the, the good thing about this is you don't need to know all those different IP addresses that they keep changing on you because they have control over that. What they don't necessarily have that much control over is the software that they put on your platform. They can't change that on, on the fly. Right. So yes. by fingerprinting their initial handshake, um, you've got them there. Yeah, exactly. That was one of the things that I really should have mentioned. <laughs> yeah, you're completely right. Yeah, <laughs> is that, yeah. To, to change an IP address, that just needs whatever method they're using, time, DNS, whatever. To change a fingerprint, you, you have to redeploy your software. In fact, recompile and redeploy the yeah. software. 
yeah, that's a much bigger task for someone to have to deal with than um, than yeah than changing IP addresses of your CNC. Very cool. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, Cisco's reached out to you with all the uh, the malware that they've given you, right? And and been able to, uh, you know. I, <laughs> I can't say that right now because this, as we talked about on Twitter, this is going to be a couple of weeks in the future. So by the time that this airs, it, it, they might have actually contacted you. But so far, you've heard nothing from them as of the, the 3rd of February. So uh, Yeah, I, I haven't currently. Uh, but I mean, who knows? I'd have to comment on the blog post in the hope that they pick up that I'm doing this stuff. So I'm hoping that they'll they'll share info because i think it would be mutually beneficial if i can give them a way of detecting and acting on it and they could provide me the pcaps and i can actually sort of get the data and get some fingerprints out there for people because if this is that prevalent as they're saying then i think having the fingerprints Wait, out there for okay. anybody that has hang on time out i'm lost did i pass out and get abducted for a few minutes what were you, what are you guys talking about cisco and you didn't read the link you? down there Cisco apparently uh, me was, and every other listener didn't. Okay, so come on, guys. There's a link in the show notes. Okay, about um, uh, TLS being used for privacy and applications, and what. Um, so apparently, uh, Cisco is using something called uh, data from Threat, Threat Grid, which is a malware analysis sandbox, and they found that malware is starting to use TLS connections for propagation and communication between uh, command and control servers and themselves and, uh, and other, right. you know, their, their other clients on the network. And, and that's news? Well, uh, I, I saw it on Twitter, so yeah, it's news to me. Okay. <laughs> that's how I get all my news now. So. All right. Um, yeah, they said 98.25% of malicious TLS traffic they observed was HTTPS over port 40, 43, or 443, and they were using... Um, uh, either you know other other SSL or TLS ports like 993, which is IMAP over SSL, or 995, which is POP3. They also found port 500, which is ISACAMP, which is the uh, TLS uh, or the SSL VPN connections for for SSL connections. So they were talking about how um, you know malware uses the TLS protocol, and you know they got some fancy graphs in here. And I, I sent this on to Lee because I was like, oh yeah, hey, we're going to be talking about TLS fingerprinting. Is this something that your TLS fingerprint app or application would be able to find? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And uh, so he had made a, a comment on the at the end of the article about he's using techniques to fingerprint TLS connections, and he, you know, he p he pimped out his his blog at Square Lemon, <laughs> and uh, you know he was so, so that Lee, giving um, some keycaps. If you need if you need some samples, I can I can give you some samples. He knows a guy that would be great. I mean, if there if there are samples, I'll happily run them through it. It takes two seconds. And I'll put <laughs> the fingerprints out and. I'm just thinking. I don't want to turn you into. You have to be like, careful, though. And, with what? Sorry. Uh the samples that oh, I give you. Oh, I thought yeah, you meant yeah. PCAP samples. Yeah. No, he'll awesome. happily infect your drive for you there, Lee, if you want. Uh, you know? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. I mean, I don't want to turn it necessarily into like a full antivirus thing. But if there's um, if there's malware that's out there using TLS, I don't see any issue with putting the signature in there. And if people see those signatures, at least using it as a flag to go and investigate something, if nothing else. Okay. Um, Man, this is uh, this is awesome. Okay. Um, wow. I need to incorporate. Okay. So you need to get a Windows version going so I can incorporate this in, <laughs> in the lab that I use. Well, and I, it'll just be another signature that I can that I can put. Um, you know, in my list of signatures for each uh, type of nefarious uh, application that I come across, that would be it's, awesome. Well, I, 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 I would love to. I have absolutely no idea how well it works on Windows. I mean, it's written to be portable. It compiles on Linux, BSD, and OS X with both Clang and GCC. So it's as portable as I can make it. <laughs> I know Windows yeah. always needs like some kind of cludge to make it work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether if I did it under Sigwin or something, whether it might work. I'll have a look. I must admit, it's not that I'm saying it doesn't work under Windows. It's I haven't tried. <laughs> well, you need to build an app called Enu. It's wine backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Works in VMware, though. <laughs> well, there you go. So if you, if you could run that. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, you could you could probably do that and then set up the networking so that you were sniffing traffic um, on the on the Windows box. In fact, in all seriousness, if you want to get going on Windows with it quickly, that was something I forgot to mention. It doesn't just live sniff; it will take PCAP files. So if you want to sniff on Wireshark or something, save a PCAP and play it back. It'll open a PCAP file natively and do just the same. Very, Very nice. good. Okay. Well, that was awesome. I uh, I'm so glad that we were able to finally get you on, even though you know you were you're a busy guy. You're jet setting. You know you're flying around <laughs> Leviathan's <laughs> Gulfstream Five. You know helping out people. Like I that's understand. exactly what my life you know, is like. <laughs> bottle service. You know making it rain. I I get you. It's cool. You know that that whole <laughs> glitzy consultant life. You know so. <laughs> Um, for, for people who have not listened to our prior podcasts, uh, that you've been on and they damn well better, you know, put that down for homework, where would they get a hold of you on the, on the, you know, out there on the internets? Okay. So Twitter, it's sin acts. <laughs> I geniusly <laughs> made an unpronounceable one. So S Y N A C K P S E, uh, or squarelemon.com, which is my blog, uh, or LeviathanSecurity.com if you want professional consulting. <laughs> oh. Wow. Okay. Wow. I... Are you part owner yet? Yeah, you should. No, be. I'm not. <laughs> totally should be. And you're also, um, you have the, the at fingerprint TLS yes, Twitter that's handle. The... Yes, I got that just for the uh, app. So people that are interested in that but not interested in anything else I do can just follow that and get like a filter down just to do with this version. Yeah. Oh, and so, your app's on GitHub. So, I mean, if they search for you, is, they yes. can find you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's, yeah, it's just Lee Brotherston is the user on GitHub. So Very cool. All right. It's I shoved it in the in your show notes document as well. So yeah, yeah, just check out the show notes. It's got a bunch of articles in his GitHub, and actually, he's got the videos from Sector. And is that the YouTube uh, from DerbyCon, or is that is that it another is one? Indeed. Okay, no, that's DerbyCon. Yeah, very cool. All right, and then of course, I actually put a fancy graphic in there that kind of shows the uh, the the TLS handshake. I've got a couple examples in there. Ooh, so. look at you. I know, right? I got to do something because I was totally lost on the whole map thing there. I was told there was no map. <laughs> there is. So, uh, Mr. Betcher, how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to? Uh, they can reach me on Twitter. Just uh, I am me. I'm uh, at Betcher Pwned, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. Did you have to think about <clears throat> Get You thought about that one for a second. I, I felt that. So. Um, and also, um, don't you have a you have a website as well for your application that you had mentioned in the podcast? You, you know, people might want to synergize Lee's with yours. Yeah, you can go to imfsecurity.com. There you go. Might as well pimp out everybody since everybody's got a company now. You know, entrepreneurship. You know, whatever. <laughs> so, so, um, so when you bought your um, your new MacBook that you were talking about. Your old one busted. Yeah. Is that under your company name? So you could like take a tax deferral? Um, I don't know if Cascadia Security and Consulting, patent pending, uh, is is <laughs> going to do that. I, I got a Mac Mini because I, I actually picked up a big fat Lenovo with 32 gigs of RAM in it because I was wanting something a little more beefy. So, um, yeah. Is it pre-pwned? It, it has all the super fish I ever want on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, to to get back to how people can get a hold of us because that's important, uh, we're uh, at BreakSec. The official podcast uh, Twitter is at BreakSec, uh, B R A K E Sec. You can find me at Brian Break. That's B R Y A N B R A K E. Uh, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn. We are on a gob of different networks. I mean, Player FM, TuneIn Radio, uh, Stitcher. Uh, God, there's just too many to mention. Uh, and it's actually been helpful because it's uh, helped uh, people find us, which is excellent. It's always good for people to find us. Let me see if I can click on those. Uh, Jay Shulman just posted a podcast today, 3 February. It's going to be a little late by the time it comes up. But he uh, he did an interview with us uh, about uh, our lives and, and everything, so that was good. Uh, we're on Tumblr. We have an RSS feed. If you have comments or questions, hit us up at bds.podcast at gmail. Um, yeah, so that's it. Lee, are you going to be talking anywhere in the next uh, few months? Are you going to be at DEF CON or the Black Hats or the, uh, well, RSA will be over by the time this posts, but uh, <laughs> were you uh, at the RSA? Did you like it? 
<laughs> nope, I wasn't there, and I won't be there. No, I have no idea. Uh, I have not. I, I I don't know about speaking. I haven't arranged any speaking this year yet. Uh, conference so far. I've just been to Shmoo, um, and I have yet to book up the rest of the year. The plan is, unless something goes horribly wrong, I'll be at the Vegas Trio at the very least. Okay. Uh, oh, and Sector and B sides Toronto for sure. Everything else is a we'll see currently. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Well, Lee, appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, keep, keep on keeping on and uh, kicking ass. And that, this was <laughs> awesome. I, I, I'm definitely going to listen to this one again, just to, to catch all the nuances I missed and, and learn the maths. And um, yeah, that was it for breaking down security. I hope everyone had a great week and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.